Hey, Father. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. So, what are we talking about today? Fine. Okay. Call back later. <gasps> you guys, this week we're talking all about what is a savior. Welcome to another episode of Bible Stories with me, Brianda. Brianda. And of course, another week, another dollar. La Clara NYC behind the wheel. Thank you, honey. How are you? I am doing well. I'm warm. I have a nice headscarf. Uh, uh, so I'm feeling I'm feeling very wintry today, as you are you. Great. Yeah, me too. I have a I've become a big fan of this. How do you call it? Como print? No, uh, the hats, the bucket the fuzzy hats. hats. The fuzzy hats. I love Clara them. is wearing a fuzzy bucket hat with a cow print. Yeah. That's a cow say. print? I would say, no? What do you think? I guess so. No, it is. I don't know what print it is, but I like it. It's random. I'm into it. You, We look, we look, uh, we're a good pair. We're definitely wintry. It's winter in New York. It's cold. Definitely. It's about to be like 16 degrees. Oh, <sighs> I love it. I'm not looking forward to it. I like the cold. You know how people talk about being by the beach and like, oh. Yeah, that's what I like. I don't know. I don't like the beach much, the sand. I know. You don't like the hot. It's true. I'm not really a fan of heat. I know. It's but true. I'm from Boston. Remember on the summertime? Now I'm, it's coming to my, my memory now. Oh. Remember when we went for a picnic in, in Brooklyn one time at the park and I was loving the sun and you're like searching for the I shade? I asked you to cover me. Yep. Because I didn't want any more sun. True. I don't know. I don't like it. But I so, love like, but the, I've realized that the way people describe their feelings when the sun beams on them, and blah, 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 mm. the only thing I can compare that to is like a concert. Like, a concert. A concert. Wow, well, that's concert. interesting. Why? Like, how do you. Just the, the feelings that people get from being under the sun, getting that, those rays. I don't like that feeling on oh, my I body. I love it. I know, and a lot of people yeah, explain yeah, yeah, yeah. the same thing. They say it's like, it's peaceful. It feels mm. nourishing. They say all these things. That's how I feel about going to a concert. Like it feels nourishing. It feels like, <gasps> like nutritious. That's I interesting. Uh, but you are very um, musical. Like I think non-musical people feel that way about concerts too. Some, I mean, and yeah, you can also love the beach and also love concerts too. <laughs> I'm just saying the way I could describe or compare them. Uh, Clara, before uh, we dive into this week's episode, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what a savior is in mm -hmm. terms of the Bible, mm -hmm. cool. which is God's written truth. I am a Christian woman for those of you that are new here. Uh, but we always talk in the intro about like random things and... Let me preface this by saying I have files. It's my way of journaling on the notes app. I've been doing these files since 2012, 2011 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anywho, files on people, files on places, things. I divide them and I organize them in a way that works for me. And I compile throughout the years just all of the notes and the voice notes of when I was in my year of transitioning from atheist oh, to Christian because wow. I thought that could be useful. That's you know? interesting. I think that's the demo that I think, I mean, no, our demo is everyone, but for whatever reason, the messages that I get, there's a lot of yeah people in the middle. There's a, there's something happening here where mm. we're introducing people to the middle. Like the middle is really finding yeah. this and I'm, it's cool. Cause I don't know. I feel like we're all kind of in the middle until we get to heaven. But anywho, uh, And I, I, there, was, there was something that was triggered by something que pasó hoy en día, uh, about something that happened today, <laughs> presently. Sorry, guys. And we just recently found out that Betty White died. You yeah. Know, Betty White, rest in peace. Oh, that was tough. But also 99. I know. I mean, it's a good age to That's die. That's a you know? great, what a great life. Mm -hmm. Like instead of saying, oh, she almost hit a hundred. No, 99 oh, is she good. She hit 99, honey. Yes. That's a lot of years. <laughs> Those are like, holy, mo how, what? To, to, she has seen like 18 presidents <laughs> or like 12, I think. I don't know, like insane. But uh, there was something that I saw after I was reading all of my ex-atheist files, or no, mm. I have um, the retired atheist files is what I named it now. Uh, 
Clara put this image here. This is what I saw that was kind of triggering. Not triggering in a way that I was uh, harmful for me. It triggered this idea to talk about okay. it with you. And it was a quote that Betty's assistant said were her last words before she died. Oh, wow. What and was it? They said that her last word that she uttered before she died was her husband Alan's name. She just said Alan. And when I- Was he dead? He when died in the he died. 60s, I believe. Uh, mm. They had been married already for like 20 years. He died, he was sick, I believe. And when I saw that, let me tell you, my heart was a puddle. Melting. I felt like, wow, love is real, love is here. There's, there's love for all of us around. And look at this, brava. And that was the completion of a love story. Mm. Like it was just like a moment where I thought, and I felt so warm and hopeful. I don't know. Love is like that. It's infectious in that way. Yeah. And I don't know these people. I don't, I know. you yeah, know? Yeah. What? But there's also something about older people that love each other so much that makes, at least, at least me, it makes me like, Wow, it's like so inspirational. Like you see these 80 year old couples that they're like so cute to each other and like I love taking it. care to each other. It's like, oh, what is it about? It yes. makes you melt your heart. It's like so sweet. You said the word inspirational. It's like, yeah. ooh. It's like, okay, it is possible, I guess. It's like a, a lot of people nowadays doubt whether true love exists, is possible, you know. And then you see these things and it's like, Oh, it does exist. Exactly. Well, how this correlates to uh, where I want to take the conversation is I was sitting in about 20 minutes of joy oh. just off seeing that little excerpt, that little image of the assistant saying that Betty White's last words were Alan. And of course, like clockwork, Doom and gloom, Brianda pokes her little head out and says, What if the assistant was lying? Why would what she? If it, what if it was a lie? Why would she lie about this? What if Betty's last breath was nothing? Nada. So, what's the point of her lying on Clara? I don't know. I, I don't know. What I'm saying is that intrusive thought came, and I want to know if she's capping. Like, I want to know. I. Listen, it's really beautiful, that idea of it being Alan. But how many people don't experience that poetic kind of beautiful, oh my, uh, remarkable kind of love? Like love is also simple and unremarkable, right? Wait, 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 wait. I bring this up because on the files of the ex-atheist files, mm -hmm. There was a moment where I was met with a similar fork in the road where I saw and felt a window of, oh, joy, inspiration, how sweet, holy cow, a relationship with God could be cool. And then immediately, because remember I'm in the transition, the immediate was, that's enough, that's enough. It's not really, or this is just nothing or this is all for nothing. We're just animals. Like there was like a, there was this shift that I can see in my written, in my, in my mm -hmm. writing. And I thought about it this way. I don't care about that intrusive thought or I do, I'll hold space for it, but I'm not believing it. I'm gonna deliberately choose to believe that Betty said Alan mm -hmm. because it makes me feel more hopeful. It makes me feel more joy than the other story did. Or is. Okay. Why do I think it could be a lie? Because the media lies all the time. I know yeah, it because I, I work just, in it. People lie when they have a motive behind. Like, I don't see, like, what do you get I from? do. I'll tell you what the motive could be. Uh, she has a documentary coming out in a couple months. She didn't make her People magazine top the cover, which was supposed to celebrate her 100. She didn't even get to it. She has a movie coming out later this year. They have to keep that allure alive that makes people want to go to the... There are a lot of things. And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist. Because like I said, I am choosing to believe that that was Betty's last mm -hmm. uh, word. I think it's beautiful. And it's not my story to tarnish, right? Her assistant knew her for decades. That's disrespectful, you know? But... I 
can't. That's how your brain works. Basically, that's what you're saying. No, uh, like when you see this type of information and your brain automatically goes like, what if it's not true? And then uh, it's not that it's an automatic thing. I just think humans doubt and they should yeah, question yeah, well, everything. They should, should always question everything. Question everything. Yeah. Uh, it, it just negates the idea that like, like a belief in God is this like submission, this delusional submission. It's like, oh no, it's a deliberate choice because these feelings are both real. Oh, after seeing you and learning more about how people devote themselves to uh, religion or faith, it is work. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to accept this idea blindly. <sighs> you have to actively, like, I may not believe in it, but I can see that it takes work and it takes choosing it every single day of your life. You have to choose it. Almost is a bad comparison, but almost like, all right, no, this is a very, I don't think it's well, going to come say it, Clara, and then we'll edit it out if it's okay. bad. Okay. It's almost like, you know, um, Alcoholic Anonymous, that every day they have to choose not to drink. Absolutely. So it's like an effort that you proactively, not effort, but something that you proactively have to choose. Yeah. But, but like God in this, you know, example is like good and alcohol is bad, but. I love addicts. Oh gosh, let me, wow, what am I saying? Jeez. <laughs> I'm saying the story. <laughs> maybe I should. Maybe I should reconsider all of this. You know the worst thing. I think you said it on last episode too. Because I believe it. I just. I'm <laughs> well, saying, at least you're consistent. There's a. There's a something about the story of an <clears throat> addict that is so like inherently spiritual. Right. Yeah. And I, that's why I've, I'm fond of them. But on um, what you were saying, to choose it every day, you're absolutely right. And it's work. You know, what is it? Faith without work is dead faith. That's exactly it. Like people, I know it's the, the more, okay. The more exciting truth about Bible Brianda is, huh, the Bible girl did acid and found God. <laughs> mm. uh, that's not exactly how it went. Like the acid was really, it was gave me a pronounced defibrillator shock. You know, it shocked me. I, it got me to quiet my brain, yeah. But what about the days that followed? They were very, very tumultuous <laughs> and very trying times. And that's where the ex-atheist files comes. It, it's like all of my thoughts- Your diary. Coming undone. Yeah. The process. And I don't know, that was a, that's something that I wanted to bring to the Bible Bay I think we should create nation. something with that. That's a very interesting, because um, it's literally like a diary from your process going from uh, atheist or agnostic, because at the time you were already like agnostic, no closer to your deciding that you, you're religious. I have a song called Blue Orange that is the, the um, it was, it, I needed to write something. It's something I wrote during the trip when the trip was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> like, Mah! it was not like the, like the cool piece. No, it was very terrifying. Oh. And facing your mortality is not, comfortable right that's but also that's what we do the trip for it's not about you're not there what what, what do you mean facing your mortality your mortality because in the, when i was tripping during my first acid trip it i had moments of like facing my own mortality like, like you i was dying as far as i was concerned death was imminent imminent okay but that was your brain tricking you it's not like it your heart was it was, was hallucinating. hallucinating. Okay, okay. Yes. I, I don't know. It could be that it affected you physically and you almost died. Of course. You know, but that's why people with an agitated psychosis should not do that, should not deal with psychedelics, you know? That's crazy. Um, but in that moment, you're faced with a lot. And I remember, in, I just, I saw like orange, blue orange, and it was like a, like a cold, like a, oh my gosh. It felt like I was in another planet, planet's atmosphere. Like, and I was just blue orange. Wow. It's a really dark, dark, dark song. Like, I don't even know if I would, I maybe, I don't know if I would show you. It's very dark. But there, I, I mentioned that because there are a ton of little, imp, like, cr breadcrumbs of my, who I used to be, that I don't have any intention on, like, resurfacing all of it. But it's, uh, some of it we can, we can do You some. can see that's like, oh man, some of the best art comes from those places and then they do it one day and then the next they throw it out. That's how I feel about the stuff that I write mm. and the stuff that I say. Sometimes I'm like, it comes in and then it leaves and then I never look back by, <laughs> you know? Because I know that there is this like sea of other ideas in creation because if it comes through me, 
it's gonna be cool. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And also because you know you have a talent when it comes to create. Like you're you're a creator, you know? It's in in, in you you do have a talent and it's in your nature. Like you're you tend to create. So it's gonna happen again. I, I tend to create because I've done it for many, many years. It's a product of many, many years of doing. I hate to make it sound like it's this ethereal thing. I've worked my ass off. I no, no, no. I'm not saying you haven't worked no, your ass off. No, I know, I know, I know. But I mean, like, in terms of, so not in terms of, oh, yeah, you're talented because you have this, you know, divine talent here in your, that you don't have to work, you know, put effort and it just comes out. Not in terms of like that, but meaning that if you choose to create all the time, it's because your brain is wired in a way that uh, that's what calls you more. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I'm uh, una loca de, de organizing. I, I, my, I waste so many hours of my life cleaning and reorganizing shit for nothing. But that's, what, that's where I go. I don't know why. That's where my <laughs> brain goes, okay? Your brain goes to create. It, it's just how I process information too yeah. sometimes. Or writing, writing stuff down. I don't know why. I just never thought it was that. I thought that everyone has it. It's just a matter of those who did more of it or not. Like I think everyone has the is a creator or a creative. I think everyone has it in them. It's just a matter of how often are you doing it? A lot of people are in jobs, nine to fives, offices, or they're working these hours that don't allow them to because when they leave, they're exhausted. That's yeah. what's kind of cool about living in New York where you get to get these one-off gigs that pay enough to hold you over. And in the interim time, in between the chaos, you get to create shit. Mm. And that's, I don't know, that, but I do it all. And when you do it enough, it becomes a little more natural. Mm. You end up being like, oh, I've done so many hours of this that I can do it with my eyes closed. Yeah, like everything. You when know? You get, yeah. But I think when it's, it's not new anymore. That's what I meant by I work at it. It wasn't to pat myself on the work at my work ethic. It was in a way, it was in a way to say we're all creators. We're all creatives. It's just a matter of how often are you at the gym, baby? How mm. often are you at the creator gym? True. You know, and why are you doing it for? I know why I'm doing it. Mm. And, I, and if I'm confused one day, I close my eyes and I ask, what's going on here? <laughs> Before I didn't have that. But at the, as an atheist, when I fell, fell through a lull, I would just pick depression. Now I can get to have depression and Christ, which is so much more like, listen, it's a lot more cozy over there. I'm going to pick that one. Again, I'm going to pick that one. Depression and Christ, at least. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know what I'm saying? Anywho, that's what I wanted to bring to the thing and to the to the pod today. And yeah, I don't know, not too deep, but a nice little appetizer before the episode. I also know that I saw the analytics. Do you know Wait. that we have some Bible babes? Obviously not our most loyal. We love you. I mean, we love everyone, but we love our, you know, who you are. <laughs> but I saw our analytics on YouTube and like it was just a pattern of everyone dropping off after the intros. They stay for the catch-ups wow. and they don't watch the stories. Those are the atheists. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe honestly, maybe. Maybe those are the atheists. Um, but saying. honestly, like in that that's another thing. Someone said someone I wrote a comment that said, uh, you, you. Is that Jesus in the other room? <laughs> um, I read a comment that said, oh, Brianda, I just saw Brianda. Oh, I unsubscribed. I unsubscribed months ago. <laughs> and um, I saw her on Rory and Mall, and then I also saw her on Weezy's. And you know what? She's actually really good. She's got the podcasting thing down. I think the problem is the content. The content. <laughs> yeah, I remember. He, I remember exactly his comment. He literally just announced to the internet that I'm, oh, this is done for me. I'm unsubscribing. No one gives a f No one cares about your proclamations and announcements, but thank you, buddy. Anyways, um... He was saying the problem is the content. No, the problem is not the content. The problem is my content is not for you. So for him, the problem was the content. Like that, that no, was the problem for him. But when you write that on a public forum, if you say something like that in someone's store, like if you say in someone's store, oh my God, the problem is the shirt. Oh, the shirt. 
I have a problem with the shirt and you're shouting it in the in the my store in front of other people. You know what I'm saying? No, so I that that's yeah. what I, that's how I view it. Oh, as my baby. Of point. course, this is my baby and I work my ass off for the part that people don't watch. Mhm. The shit that I don't plan and I don't spend hours editing and rewriting, they stay for. It it honestly is so uh it reminds me of the industry. It really but, does remind me of the industry. No one cares about work. But Brie, this what? is one of the things that you have to remember. This is not for everybody. This is okay. You cannot like, you cannot be liked by everybody. Oh, shit. <laughs> I realized. <laughs> this is not for everybody and that's okay. Whatever you do here, you, you cannot please everyone and that's okay. I get the part where you say you wouldn't be screaming in a, like a little owner's store, like, oh, the, the cotton is not real. You know, the cotton, is I get that part. But for people to tap in, listen, uh, that's not their thing and tap out. You can be mad then at that. Then just do that. Don't oh, yeah, come yeah. on Don't my front lawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Don't come on my front lawn and on it. That I understand. But I'm assuming the bigger we grow, the more it's gonna happen. Oh yeah, 100%. Like, and you can like, oh, I, I already know, know don't that- Don't let it affect you because- There was, there was, um, no, I, and I, obviously I'm not even talking to him. I'm talking at other, I'm, there are other things that I'm, that I'm experiencing about the internet as, a, as the B Bible stories grows. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're like, on, they're not the, they're not my strongest attributes. But uh, I know for a fact that I'm going to have to stop reading DMs soon. I mean, not soon. I give myself a year. Uh, and I know I'm not going to be able to handle dealing with social media. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to do it for my own self. Like, for yourself, you see I, I, my personal. I'm not you. active on there. I'm not. That's yeah. not. I agree with you. I don't care. I, I want to get my bag another way. And if it's going to take me forever to get there, I, I pick that. It sounds like pussy shit, but... At the end of the day, you know what I want. I want yep. to get married. I want to have kids. I want to create in my house. Mm. Wherever gets me to that, that's what I'm going to do. If I don't get to wear the Bottega, Veneta, Bottega, uh, Sarah, McLaughlin shoes, whatever the shoes were. <laughs> if I don't get to do that as an influencer, I will be a okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But there are things that I got to work on. And um, hopefully Bible stories will be able to, you know, hire someone to to handle that because I just want to tap dance ta -da, tap dance and bow <laughs> and praise the Lord praise him anyways uh join the Patreon I if you want uh I, wow that sounds really bad I guess I'm defeated now you are it's gosh fine. that comment oh but you don't have to let it affect you so much You know, part of it, and, and I know this is not going to help right now because that's not what you want to listen at all, but part of it is your fault because you allow it to affect you so much. Well, when you, yeah, yeah. You have to like, in Who's Spanish, you say, me resbala. Do you, you say that? Me resbala. Yeah, like water off a duck's back. Water off a duck's back. I don't know. It's a... When you say something and I don't, me entra por aquí, me sale por ahí. Yeah, me, that's me, what, me resbala lo que me digas. That's exactly what, that's yeah. the expression. Um... So you have to learn to... Uh, uh, well, guess what? Like, Faith, you got to work on that. Because I... Yes, I, that's you have not to. something that... And it's not... It, it's a process. It's not something that, oh, I'm just going to start not caring about these type of comments. And then, boom, you don't care anymore. Nah. I also have a whole lot of time on my hands now. If I had other stuff going on, or even if it was... I mean, I don't want to be in a relationship right now, for now. But... If I had other things, it would be easier to like, like I'm putting my everything into this. If I had other, or if I was on set five, four days out of the week or something. I think. What? I don't think so. I, I think, think so. Of course, if you have less time, you're going to look, yeah. at, like think about it less. But the attitude you choose to pick in front of los acontecimientos, whatever the. Um, Comments? No, no, yeah. But whatever happens. That's on you. Like, it doesn't matter how much time you have to, to reflect on it or not. I know, but I wonder what it would do to help. I just have a lot of, I need to stop putting all of my, I don't know, 
I feel like people who put their everything in any one thing are sensitive. You know, I'm yeah. sensitive. I, I can I can understand that. I can definitely yeah, understand I'm, that. I'm, I'm sensitive. I'm sensitive about my and that's a problem for any kind of creator, especially because a lot of people look at this. They're like, you think coming on the, there's you think coming on a mic and we're doing whatever is art. It's like, no, this isn't like any other podcast. We like I I'm scripting. I'm li like I, it takes me about four hours before we come in for me to memorize the bulk of whatever I'm going to say. <clears throat> yeah. The only reason why I have to pull out my phone is for scripture, really, like, or if I forgot a beat or something. This is like, like you're prepared. You're literally pre preparing a class. Like any other podcast. That's what I mean. They will just like have to think of topics and maybe do a little research on one of the topics and just come here and speak your mind. You literally have to prepare a class before coming here. Read all the chapters, pick Study what it is, myself, stands out learn more. Learn it myself. Yeah. Like, you it know? is It is a hard that's job. That's why it hits. And I think that's another thing. It's because this isn't like every other show. Like, But it, still, this is going to happen to you on this podcast, um, in life, in general. I know. So, it's... And I'm highly unlike... I mean, I'm likable, and I'm also unlikable. If my if my last appearances are any indication, it's like, I'm, I'm it's, it's split. You either like me or you don't. So I better buckle up. You're like cilantro. <laughs> either you Kinda. love it or you don't. <laughs> Listen, either you taste like soap or you taste like a delicious garnish. <laughs> well. <laughs> Anyways, let's get into the story. Sorry, I had to interrupt the show. Look, are you tired of not knowing what stocks to invest in or even where to begin? Then join the Red Panda Stock Club, babes. Started by Ian Dunlap, or as we all know him as the master investor, or from his contributions every week with Earn Your Leisure. There are a lot of people talking about investing, but none of them have the track record that Ian has. The proof is in the pudding. He called to invest in Moderna at 43 in April of 2020, and now it's at 408, which is an 820% return. Once you join the Red Panda Stock Club, here's what you'll get. The four best stocks to invest in for long term. The best entries on the planet. A year's worth of the best companies to invest in. The worst companies to stay away from. Unlimited access to Red Panda for 365 days. And lastly, you also get a weekly meeting from Ian and the Red Panda family every Monday night at 9 p.m. Central, after Market Mondays. Baby, if you're tired of getting your behind kicked in the market or simply want to learn where to begin with all the tools at your disposal, Red Panda is the place for you. Go to joinredpanda.com and enter the code BIBLE to get 50% off the next two weeks. It's easy as that, babes. Clara, grab the champagne. Back to the show. This week, we're talking about what exactly a savior is. But first, let us run down some house rules before we get into the meat and potatoes of the story. So from last week's episode, we know that Jehu was ruler over the kingdom of Israel. He later dies. Um, he dies after a 28 year rule and his son Jehoahaz ends up taking his, uh, his steed after. And you guessed it, ends up being a corrupt king too. Meanwhile, in the South, little seven-year-old King Joash, remember Joash? The one that Athaliah tried to kill, but the priest Jehoiada ended up taking him away, hiding mm -hmm. him and training yeah. him. So th that's kind of where we are right now. And uh, what's the last thing I could say? Um, the priest Jehoiada ended up training Joash in the best way. He, he got him like his wives. Yes, there were two wives, um, children. He sh shaped him up really well, especially in the beginning. And for reference, the chapters and uh, the books that we're gonna be covering today are 2 Kings chapters 12 and 13, but we're also gonna sprinkle in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 19 to 21, just for a little bit more context, because you guys already know, you know, Chronicles is MSNBC and Kings is Netflix. You already know, blah, 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 you know, you know what I'm saying. Now, let's go into the story. 
2 Kings chapter 12 is where today's readings begin. And while the kingdom in the north is getting murked by the Syrians, like at this point, the Syrians already acquired uh, Gath, which was one of the, the one of the tribes, like other nations are literally ripping the north apart. Uh, while that's happening uh, in the south of Judah, we've got Joash and dude, Joash ends up ruling for 40 years total. So it wasn't, it wasn't 40, four zero. Whoa. Yeah. It, it wasn't all bad. Uh, like in the beginning in chapter 12, we discovered that Joash had uh, commissioned a temple to be built and it was so important for him to uh, build a temple that kind of resembled his upbringing with mm -hmm. Jehoiada. And uh, even Jehoiada would be the one to oversee. So he ended up uh, make, putting out a decree where he was going to tax his citizens in order to get the temple built. Wow. Now, after 23 years, Joash realized that people were being taxed, but the temple wasn't being built. Hmm. He was like, so what's, what's going on here? There's some, some suspicious business happening. Wait, it took him 23 years to realize? To realize, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know what? Honestly, have you seen Joe Biden speak? Uh, one sentence, one entire coherent sentence before? <laughs> these king, these, I mean, he's not a king, but these kings are, uh, are, uh, hold on, there's something in my, in my eyelash, Jesus. Clarence, there's something in my eyelash. Uh, I think it's one of the hairs from your hat, there you go. <laughs> for those of, the, for the audio listeners, there's like the Please hair. Please go to YouTube. The hair like, on your hat. You what? can't miss this shit. <laughs> okay, yes, there's hair, there's fur on my hat. It's not real, Peta. Okay. Um, I don't even know what I was saying. Point of the story is that Joash ends up figuring out that the temple was not being built. So he ended up scrubbing that idea and saying, you know what? Let's just make the building of the temple strictly donation based. We're gonna leave a box right there in the front. You can donate if you want. And then we'll just take, we'll just build it a lot slower. Mm -hmm. And using those same funds, uh, the priests would also be getting paid. So all of that money, all of that stuff, we're just gonna stop taxing, we're gonna do this method. And he, uh, uh, and, um, it, he, just, he found an ethical way to do it. Like he appointed people to handle all of the money and it would be either for paying the priests and the guards or building the temple. Capiche? Mm -hmm. After several years, that temple ended up being restored. I mean, by the guidance of Jehoiada, uh, he meant business and you know, Jehoiada ended up dying at, I think it was like 130 years old. And he was there for the restoration of the temple. But Jehoiada's death, not only is a marker for the completion of the temple, it also marks the shift where Joash started distancing himself from the Lord. Mm. He started, he began to fall. He began to allow worshiping of other, the other gods, the Asherim and other things. Oh yeah, honey. Mm, mm, mm. It was really bad. And uh, the people did not like this. They, did, they, they like were really upset. Let's uh, go to some scripture for context over what I just said. Second Chronicles chapter 24, verses 17 and 19. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Eshurim and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. Let me break that back down a little bit. So during this time, some of the people are revolting. They're like, uh, hello, Joash, what are you doing? What's not uh, landing on you? What are you doing? Jehoiada, who is now dead, his son, Zechariah, ends up going to Joash being like, hey, bro, what's going on? What's going on up there? Do you remember me? Hi, I'm basically your stepdaddy's son. <laughs> He's like, hello, what are you doing? And do you know what Joash does? Oh. He sends people to kill Zechariah. What? And he kills Zechariah. <gasps> Jehoiada's son. 
The man who raised him, he killed his son, his brother, basically. Wow. Ooh, corruption. Wow. Ooh, corruption. You know what? Let's go into scripture for a little bit of this. Second Chronicles chapter 24, verse 21 through 22. But they conspired against him, Zechariah. And by command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus, Joash, the king, did not remember the kindness that Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had shown him, but killed his son. And when he was dying, he said, may the Lord see and avenge. <laughs> mm, those and, were his last words. And avenge the Lord did, oh. because the Lord wreaked havoc on Judah. Oh, and he hasn't even seen the bulk of it. Because, like I said, the Lord's not going to even just punish this generation. Other generations adopt that. It's, it's like the death that never ends, you know? Um, but I do want to want to mention the a little bit about the drama that happened with Syria, Hazel and Ben-Hadad. Like, this is a part of the Lord avenging. Mm. You know, he ends up bringing on enemy nations to, you know, cause destruction because of these failed and flawed kings. Second Kings, chapter 12, verses 17, 18. I didn't know we were going to be reading so much from the text. Uh, some weeks are he text heavy, some other mm. weeks are not text heavy. But Second Kings, chapter 12, verse 17, 18. At that time, Heziel, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. But when Heziel set his face to go up against Jerusalem, Joash king of Judah took all the sacred gifts that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his fathers, the kings of Judah had dedicated and his own sacred gifts and all the gold that was found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the kings. And he sent them to Heziel, the king of Syria. Then Heziel went away from Jerusalem. What I'm saying here is when they were coming, when, when the enemy land were approaching, Joash said, crap, crap, crap. Crap, what do we do? Let's just give them a bunch of treasures. Let's give them all of our, our forefathers, my grandfathers, all of their jewels. Give it all to them. It's like a trust fund baby that doesn't know what to do. Just give it to them all. <laughs> give them the password. Give them it all. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Um, oh my gosh. High tangy, not high tangy. But you know the amount of times that I've folded under pressure? Mm. Because it at that moment... That's kind of like when you're going through a season of life where the enemy's approaching, the enemy's approaching, something's happening. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to like, you know, I don't know, pay my rent. I'm not going to be able to show up for my husband or wife. I'm not, you know, like that, whatever mm -hmm. your enemy is. That's the times when we should be asking for some guidance. Get up, get up, get up. Let's go. <laughs> um, that, those are the moments where you should be directing those worries to God. You know what he does instead? He offers them gold and jewels and treasures to see if they leave. And guess what? They end up leaving. But it just it 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 just proves that the, your money isn't where your mouth is. That's the wrong expression. Just the faith. I don't know what that was. What? I'm short circuiting here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just shows that his how distant from God Joe Ash was, mm -hmm. and how poor of a king he really is. What kind of king go, d tries to barter with enemies? First of all, they could have easily killed Joash. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's on some, it's, on, it's some weeks that's weak. No. You know, a real king wouldn't have done that. A real king would have stood firm in his belie beliefs and his faith and his morals, stood his ground. And if he dies, he dies. If we die, we die. You know what I'm saying? That's what morals are. Morals are you take this to the grave. You know, 100 for she. If your morals are like only on the weekends and then sometimes it, those aren't morals, honey. Those aren't morals, yeah. Those That's just like an opinion that you present to have. But yeah. I'm if like, I can buy your morals, you don't have morals. Thank you, honey. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Which is why I feel like this industry is going to eat me alive. <laughs> Clara, maybe you should manage me, honestly. Maybe. Like... Just look, can you just like read a couple, like how do you manage talent? Like, can you read a couple things? <laughs> I read a couple books and manage. I don't know, because I'm telling you, <laughs> Watch a I couple can't. YouTube videos or something. <laughs> I will say no to everybody. No, no. And then in 15 years, I will be in the same spot. <laughs> and there, another talent gone to waste. Nah. You know?
I don't think. I don't think so. I don't think it's gonna go this far. I mean, also, Clara, you wouldn't let me do anything.、Stupid. I wouldn't let you、uh, drown yourself and shit. No. But mind you, I, I don't know shit about this industry either. So that's what I'm saying. Really, we're lost in here. Can't you Google that? <laughs> YouTube that, Clara. How to manage talent for TV, film, and then you just negotiate. <laughs> don't you have to be a lawyer for that? No, you don't. I guess it would help. But what really helps is connections. That's the thing that really helps. I am、uh, the worst at this shit. Like、exactly. I'm the worst at connecting because I don't give a fuck about. Anything or anyone, so I'm like I'm so bad at maintaining relationships or oh, friendships. Me or, too. Because I don't, I'd be forgetting about like honestly, I don't know. You know what a lot of young actors that move to LA or New York don't know is like when casting directors really rock with you. There's like a network、uh, between like agents and managers and casting directors. They they just go to a certain group of people and they like circulate.、But、I feel like. That's every industry, to be honest. Everywhere you go is the same. Yeah, but not every industry as is as elusive as Hollywood or TV film,、yeah. where there's this idea that I take a couple classes, I get in front of the right eyes, and boom, I make it. It's like no, yeah,、so. that's not how it goes. In fact, I think the biggest detriment to me and why I wasn't successful is because for the first half of it, I was just a really bad auditioner. It was never a. I already I've said this before. It wasn't a doubt on my ability or my emotional economy. It was like I had terrible coping mechanisms with nerves that would get in the way in the room. Wow, how But, poetic is that? Is that pressure that was getting to you? And like, I was going out、happened? for like major stuff, you know. And and I'd be in rooms with these people that are so much. <laughs> More experienced than yeah. And but you want to know when the shift happened? When these casting directors began to recognize Brianda, the quirks in Brianda, and saw the windows of oh, okay. She's just scared. Yes, she's yes. Good, but she's just and、scared. guess what? Casting directors will do, which is something that takes time and networking, but casting directors will champion for you, and they will let you be in the room for as long as you want. They'll have you redo it. Okay, can you just redo it? Like they want you to. They、mm. want you to work. You, they want you to make their life easier. And if they know that you can take direction well, they will make things comfortable for you. They'll ask if you want some water. That wasn't happening before.、Mm. So I knew when I really had my reign around the quote unquote craft.、Mm. Not that it matters. I'm not working now. But like, or I, I don't know. Am I like? I'm like soft retired. I don't know what this is. <laughs> you know. But.、Mm. That was that's. I don't even know why we started talking about that. Hi, Danjay. The end of chapter twelve tells us that Joash ends up getting killed because he killed Zechariah, and the people weren't happy. So he people ended up staging a coup to have him murked, and that's how Joash dies. And the next chapter, chapter thirteen of today's reading, we takes place up in the north. The Northern Kingdom of Israel. We get an update on what's been going on with Jehoahaz. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, it's Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz is how it is. Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz. Jehu's son, the person. He's on his 17 year of his reign up in the north. And remember what I said. The, the, they've been getting bit pulled apart, but then. He gets word that Syria is going back in, and he says, "Bruh, we're at our last. You guys already took three different lands. Like, what else could you possibly take? You know." And at that point, Jehoaz prays to the Lord, and he pleads with him, "Please have mercy on us, because the Lord was angry before. Okay, that's why the Syrians were going over there in the first place." What question? Just boom. Let me let me know. You said he he begged almost to the Lord to have mercy on him, right?、Mm -hmm. Does that ever work, or the Lord has His plan, and you can say whatever you want, but He has His plan?、Uh, I'm gonna say the same thing I've said to you, and until it、uh, until it really hits, it's probably gonna be like not a good enough answer for me. The Lord knows our hearts. If you are、uh. if you are. He knows our hearts. You cannot lie to him. So if you are just smoke and mirrors begging, I—it's not even that he's ignoring you. It's that you're not tapped in.、Mm. 
Mm. Whatever you think is going on is actually not happening. You approach the Lord with an open heart so that he can, we can, you guys can both assess what's really going on. So you know, if you really mean it, he can change his plan. You yes. Uh, you know, high tangy, not high tangy. When I'm in prayer, or like especially before I eat and I really want to get to the food. Uh, thank you. The Lord knows. <laughs> and, and the Lord will convict me to be like, let's try that again. Oh, shit. And sometimes it ends up being so amazing. And sometimes it's not as amazing. Mm. But either way... I'm doing it. I'm praying before every meal. You know, it's kind of like going mm -hmm. to the gym. Like sometimes you're not going to want to go, but you go anyways. We have to, yeah. You know? Um, so he, the Lord knows our hearts. And guess what? The Lord ends up sparing him. Oh, there you go. Now let's go into some scripture. Second Kings chapter 13, verses four to five. Then Jehoahaz sought the favor of the Lord and the Lord listened to him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. Therefore, the Lord gave Israel a savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians. And the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Some translations use the word tent for home. Mm. Now, I was doing research, data research, you know, because when I saw the text and I read the English Standard Version, ESV version, uh, it's the best for me, for my uh, wiring and understanding the text as close to the Hebrew, as close to the original Hebrew as possible. Okay. And I wanted to break down the etymology of, or maybe not the etymology, just the origin of the Hebrew of the word savior. Mm. And I have some notes in my research that I compiled. So in biblical Hebrew, there is a fine line between verbs and nouns, and both can be used to describe an action or a person, place, or thing. The word, Clara, please put the Hebrew word here, Moshiah, can be used in the sense of an action, as in Deuteronomy 28, 29, where it is translated as save, but literally means causing to be delivered. The same word can be used as a noun, like in Isaiah 41, 11, where it is translated as savior, but literally means one who is causing to be delivered. And this is, uh, I got this from uh, a website that I'll link below in the description box. But uh, this author, I don't have the name at the moment, I'll link it, says that for reference, the word Moshaya as a noun, is generally translated two different ways. Like I said in Isaiah, I am the Lord and beside me there is no savior, Isaiah 43, 11. The, the, the word as a noun and as a verb still mean the, the cause of being delivered. For reference, the word Moshaya as a noun is generally translated two different ways. I am the Lord and besides me there is no savior, Isaiah 43, 11. And, but when the people of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Jerah, Judges chapter 3, verse 15. If God is the only Savior, who is Jeremiah referring to in Kings? Hmm. You know, who, who's gonna, who are they going to be saved by? Because as, as we just read in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses four to five, therefore the Lord gave Israel a savior so that they escaped from the hand of Israel. Who is the savior, right? Mm. And then in Judges, we hear Ehud. But if there's only one God, then how could there be a savior, right? Before I expand on that thought, I want to put a bow, tie a little bow around our discussion around savior the word. Remember that this verb and noun is written in the participle form. God is the one who is delivering, present tense. That's the end on what the Savior is. It is both a noun and a verb, meaning to cause to be delivered. Now going back to who is the Savior. Hmm. That is something that has been contested between all the different Abrahamic religions. Actually, all the different world religions is like, who is the Lord and Savior? Who is the Messiah? Who is the Moshiah? 
Who do you think it is, Clara? I don't believe in God. I don't know. Like, I don't think there's one. So what do you think? So what do you, what, so when you hear savior, what, what's your first, I'm, I, I need you so you can tell me where the public is. Like what, when you hear the word savior, are you turned off? Are you turned on? Are you like, what's, what goes on in you? Hmm. Definitely not turned off. I just, um, I just feel like that's a way for people that believe in God to understand maybe what God means to them. Like, like God saves them from sinning the devil or, or like bad things, saves them from themselves sometimes. Like I know all the time, I know that, um, religion gives a purpose. I know that faith, I would say more than religion, faith in a God gives a purpose. And a lot of people like they feel saved by, by having this purpose. You know, like, hey, what is it about, and I, I'm asking you this, it's not to test you. It's because it's the perk about having you here. The perk is that here we are a believer and a non-believer having these theological discussions. Uh, because I know in, from my source, from our source text, my the one that I own here, mm -hmm. our Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. That is something that I understand as truth. God was the same back then as he is today. Let's put a pin on this. It's a really complex topic and I don't even know if I can talk about it. Okay. I feel like I'm... I'm too much of a baby to talk about it. It's it's like the como calculus, you know, cal like the pre-calculus and calculus. Because mm -hmm. in my head, I'm like, who is Ehud? And I know who Ehud is, but a very elementary. Ehud is a name found in the book of Judges mm. that they said that he was the savior. Could it be possible that it's a mistranslation? Meaning when they talk about the Lord and savior, it's more um, what you just described, what would you just um, read from like, what was it like to be delivered? Like that, that he's the one that like delivers himself very much. And then when they're talking about a savior, uh, like, uh, what name was it again? Uh, Jesus, one Jesus No, Christ. not Jesus, the one you oh. just said now. Je Ehud. Ehud, yeah, Jehu, Ehud, like, come on. So that when they talk about a savior like Ehud, they actually mean like someone that saved the people from this town from something like mm. an actual savior could it be like a mistranslation where one does mean savior as we understand it in in the common tongue and when they refer to the lord it's just like mistranslated and they don't mean like the same mm, no the only reason why i say no to that is because if it was a person they would have gotten that person's birthday. That would have they would have made a coin out of that person. They would have that person. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. person would have been an idol. Just himself would have been an idol, and it didn't happen. I think that's why we don't know really when Jesus was born. We don't know much. Like if you really come to the, we don't. And I think it's intentional mm -hmm. because if we did, if the Lord wanted that to be in the written truth recorded, people would forget about Yahweh and treat Jesus like Prince. Here's the other thing. I didn't make it to the Jesus chapter yet, so I don't know anything <laughs> about Jesus. Oh, so you will. That's Clara, a hard question to answer. Clara, you're right. Because I'm a New Testament babe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Me too. I'm reading this. The Old Testament is very complex, mm. right? Like I came to by reading the New Testament. So like, it's kind of cool re reading the history of it all because I feel like I'm learning with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. You just haven't read it yet. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. You're right. We gonna get there, girl. We gonna get there. <laughs> like clockwork. They always fall. They always fall. Like they fall. They fall. The Lord delivered Israel after Joahaya. Oh my God. We have, oh, this irreverence is terrible. Okay. Let's. Jehoahaz, after he was pleading, maybe I should start from the top. Okay. Uh, after he was pleading, they still fall. They still stray away from the Lord. And right before Jehovah, hey, hey, in New York, New York. <laughs> <laughs> da, 
dun, 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 dun. Uh, right before Jehoahaz dies, Elisha is also about to die too. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Feels like closure, this chapter. It's a little poetic. Yeah, well, we're nearing the end of chapter 13. And Joash hears about Elisha being on his like last days, his mm. days are number. And Joash kind of freaks out. Because this whole, it's it's like, it's almost different. It's like, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, uh, you know how with your parents when they're alive, and in their in their forties, fifties, it's kind of like they're still around. It's cool, it's different. But now, if you have parents in your six in their sixties, their their late sixties and seventies, every single second with them is a little different. I don't see them every day. I see them maybe twice a year. That means I got what six more visits left, mm-hmm. seven more visits, eight more visits left. That's kind of grim, you know. So I feel like that same similar thing happened with Joe Ash. He realized like, oh my gosh, my daddy Elijah is about to die. So he goes over there and he goes, please, like, what do we do? I mean, of course, he's also crying because the country's in shambles. They fall again, you know? So I, I don't know where it comes from. Interpret it how you will. I don't think the truth of it is that he was coming from a place of uh, like selfishness. I don't, that wasn't revealed to me. It really was just a place of, uh, like he cried to him. That's real. He's not, like Joe Ash is not an Oscar winning actor. He was crying. Maybe overwhelmed. Overwhelmed, stressed, everything. fear. Yeah. He cries on Elisha, Elisha's shoulders. And guess what? Elisha handles it in the most cryptic Mr. Miyagi <laughs> way ever. Like, wax on. Wax off. The whole time I'm like, what does this mean, Elisha? <laughs> so uh, Joash goes in and he's crying, you know, you know, and Elisha goes, all right, grab that bow and arrow over there. And Joash goes and grabs the bow and a couple arrows or whatever. And then he goes, okay, good. Now open the east window or something like that. Like the east window, open it and shoot some bows and arrows. That shoot, No, shoot one, strike it. And he does it. Okay. And then he goes, good job. And then Joe Ash is like, um, what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> okay, I show the arrow, right. no what? <laughs> and then Elisha goes, okay, grab some more arrows. So Joe Ash goes and grabs some more arrows. And Elisha says, now strike it to the ground. And Joe Ash strikes it to the ground, strikes one, strikes two, he doesn't see him saying, he just strikes three. And then he goes, okay, I did it. And Elisha freaks out. Elisha gets mad. Let's go to the text to find out exactly why Elisha was upset with Joash after striking the arrows on the ground. Second Kings chapter 13, verse 19. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will only strike Syria three times. So he was mad because he only stopped at three. He had a bunch of arrows in his hand. He only stopped at three. And he, when, when did the metaphor come in that the floor was Syria? Listen, girl. Like, okay, where's, where's God in the story? Okay, let's, okay. Because I know you could go, it's easy to go the direction of what does that mean and how was I supposed to know? Uh, Where is God in the story? How many times, Clara, be honest with me, do you sell yourself short? Because I do it all the time. Like in my eyes, I think that's indicative of you present, having an opportunity presented to you, having the tools at your disposal, and you just... you had a couple more hours there, but I'm going to stop at three. I had six in here, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to hold on to it. Why would you do that? Mm. You know, go there, really go there. It's almost like I, I, the, I used to be scared of praying for things that were too big. Like, okay, there's no way that I'm going to be a, there's just no way that I'm going to be a series regular on a show. There's no way. Like, and it's like the Lord or the Lord one time checked me like, who are you to say what's enough and who is not? Stop that. You're not that special. One, I felt the. I remember when the Lord first saw that, like, showed me that, like, child, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop limiting yourself. If you really have faith in me, then you're on my credit card, not your own. Limitless here. 
Diamond. Black card. Black card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? We are not the same. <laughs> so that's where, that, that's where God is in that moment. But of course, when you read the Bible, stories like that happen a lot where you're like, Ugh, mm -hmm. what? And I'll be honest with you. I didn't know that the first read. But Brie, my writer, it, after discussing it and like seeing her notes on, on the script this week, I was like, wow, that's so true. You know, that's why the Bible's meant to be a collaborative thing and you're supposed to read it multiple times and it's not something that you read once, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's como, um, it has this philosophical touch that, that the more you think about it, the more concepts come out of it, no? And, and if you share point of view with other people, you know, it, it kind of helps. Clara, and also when we are, the Brianda at 25 reading the Bible does not understand the stuff that Brianda yeah. at 28 knows sure. or the Brianda at 38 will know or mm -hmm. the if God willing, if God allows me to be, or 48 will know. So that's also too, you come to it and it comes to you. You know, like mm. that's what makes these spiritual sacred texts so holy and pure. It's the fact that it doesn't matter how many times you read it, it, it will always be deep, hold information that is, has no expiration. Um, but yeah. So what are we having for dinner? <laughs> In 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, we find out that Elisha died. He gets a proper burial, you know, and there's this little part that, you know, Prophet Eli uh, Jeremiah, when he was writing Second Kings, when he was writing Kings, I'm curious as to why he he wrote this record, and because at first it seemed random, it said that Prophet Elisha was buried, and then some far out Moabites came to his burial site, and they had a dead body or something, but they were scared and. They dropped the dead body in Elisha's, uh, you know what? Let me read the text because I'm sounding real, real choppy right now. Second Kings uh, chapter 13, verses 20 to 21. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. I mean, what? That's insane. Like, I mean, high tangy, not high tangy, but I swear this is the last high tangy of the episode. But I know that Jeremiah tacked that onto chapter 13 for a reason. It's not just a, a one-off little uh, passage in chapter 13. A random body was revived from the death, from the dead, upon just touching Elisha's dead body. And it made me think, wow, wait a second, it put things into perspective. Because a lot of times we, we begin to worship these prophets because they have all these inf this information, this internal knowledge, they're conduits to the truth, you know? They, we often think that that power is coming from them. It's not. It's always coming from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Jeremiah tacked those verses on there. That body was restored, but Elisha's body was dead. His flesh was dead. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's Makes sense. there's very many different ways that you can go about it, but I remember my first couple of reads. I didn't I didn't land on that, but but again, collaborating with Bree, it's been really great. And uh, yeah, that's the end of today's reading. I guess we're ready for moral of the story. Let's go. Moral of the story is: ask him for more. Ask for more. More faith more awareness, more love, more attention, more family time, more zeros in your bank account, more recognition. You know you hunger for more sometimes. Now, that 
isn't to say that a season of less is devoid of value. No, quite the opposite. When you have less, that's when your true nature is exposed. That's your cue. The floor is yours. Ask for more. Proverbs 11.12 tells us we are to be humble. But from my understanding, that doesn't mean we are to ignore the truth of what's happening now. You want more. You want real change. Well, go on. Ask for it. You'll know you're doing it when it becomes a practice. Not the ask, per se, but rather the time you reserve to be with the Lord. He never leaves nor forsakes us, and he will do exactly what he said he will do, should we just call on him. Sometimes, you know, like Joe Ash, we cut ourselves short of the blessings that God has in store for us, maybe because we've done so many wrong things that there's no way we'd find ourselves redeemable in his divine light. Ugh, stop it, babe. You're not that special. Now put the sad violins away and pick up the phone or call him yourself. <gasps> Ooh. Hey, Father, how'd I do? Oh, great. Yeah, I told him to call you. They said that they were going to call him. You could call him. No, no, I promise they're going to call you. They haven't forgotten. Anyways, um, so about that ski trip you planned for me. I mean, Father, look at this. Look at this, Father. I look like a rich mom from Tribeca about to go to Aspen and hit the slopes. Uh -huh.